Okay, can you all hear me? Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you, Peace Action. Thank you, Maine. I had a great chance to see a bit of Maine today. It was quite fantastic. I envy you all. Can I move here? Yes. Really? Absolutely. Ooh. I'll just go and get my dog and we'll be back. It's, it's a wonderful place and a hard place, a hard place to work for peace, as so many places are. You know, the part of the world that I work on and that many of you work on, which is where a lot of, not only, but a lot of where our wars are going on, the news is pretty crummy most of the time. And the news these days is really very, very bad. But there has been some good news in the last while. And I think it's important that even as we focus on the bad news and figure out what we're gonna do to change it, we do keep in mind that we have won some victories along the way. So there was a big victory around Cuba, around finally beginning what's going to be, unfortunately, a quite long process, but nonetheless, taking the first major step towards ending this failed effort to isolate Cuba by the United States. The Iran deal was a huge victory for diplomacy over war, and that was ours. That was our victory. That was made possible because enough people in this country and around the world said, no, we are not gonna let you go back to the warmongers. There was a deal you reached, you're damn well going to insist that it happen, that it be implemented. And we won that fight. We won it by a bigger margin than anybody thought we would. That was kind of amazing. Just this week, President Obama vetoed the military appropriation bill. That was huge. Now, you know, we can't get too excited about that one. It's gonna be renegotiated and whatever. But look, anytime the military appropriations of usually about $660 billion of our tax money gets vetoed, that's a good one. And we should claim it as our own. You know, that's my line and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but just a couple of hours ago, some of you may have been in transit, maybe you didn't hear the news, but just a couple of hours ago, we got another bit of good news, which is very important. And that is that Iran has been invited to participate in the Syria talks. Finally, I mean, granted it's too late, granted what were they thinking to not have them there, but nonetheless, it's a big victory that Iran is being allowed by the United States to participate in these multi-country talks to end the Syrian war. So all of that is pretty good news. All of that is the kind of news that happens only because we work for it. None of it ha just happens on its own. None of it just happens because somebody in Washington gets a good idea and decides, oh, let's do the right thing for a change. It doesn't work like that. It works because we make it too expensive politically so that they decide they don't want to pay the price. That's the real world. That means we have to build movements. That's what Peace Action is all about. That's what Peace Action Maine is all about. It's about building movements so that we force them to do the right thing. Doesn't happen easily, doesn't happen often, but that's what our fight is about. Now having said all that about the good news, the bad news remains very, very bad. We're hearing a lot of very bad news about the wars. We don't hear how bad, I'm afraid, it really is. The numbers are so staggering, I think sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our brains around it. You know, if you look at the, at the, the uh, the question of, of Iraq, we're hearing today, again, that the Secretary of Defense says, well, we may have to send boots back on the ground. Well, excuse me, Mr. Secretary, there are now 3,500 pairs of boots on the ground already that you told us about. We don't know how many pairs of sneakers belonging to the CIA and the Special Operations people are also on the ground. Those aren't open, those are covert. Nobody's supposed to know, except, of course, the Iraqis. They know pretty well. But this is a huge challenge. This is a huge problem because we don't really think about the fact that we already have three and a half thousand US troops back on the ground in Iraq doing what military people do, doing what militaries do, killing people and breaking things. That's their job. When they're told to do it by the president, that's their job. And they do it, I would say, very well. We have escalated drone attacks. We are escalating airstrikes of all kinds. In, in just the, the last few days, there was this U.S. raid where a bunch of ISIS prisoners were freed by U.S. soldiers. One of the U.S. soldiers was killed, so we heard a lot about that one. We don't hear about all the others who were killed. Dozens of people were killed in that raid. We don't know who they all were. Maybe some of them were ISIS. 
Maybe some of them were not, which is more likely. We don't hear all of how bad the wars are. We've been hearing about Afghanistan a lot. Suddenly, the Obama administration has announced that they are not going to go ahead with their plan to withdraw all the troops from Afghanistan by the end of 2016. We're going to keep at least 10,000 troops there, the ones that are there now. Why? Apparently because the U.S. bombed the hospital in Kunduz run by Doctors Without Borders, killing it, the number is now 30 confirmed dead, still three missing, and hundreds injured. The U.S. did that. They've admitted it. They've apologized for it. They're investigating it. But an independent investigation? No, that's not on the table. <clears throat> but think about that. That's the response of the U.S. White House and the U.S. administration and the U.S. military. We've made this huge act of war against a civilian target. We've destroyed a hospital. We've killed people. We admit it was our fault. So obviously that means we have to stay there longer. What, and do it again? What are they thinking? This is crazy. It was like, how many, I'm looking around the room, I'm seeing most people here have been around almost as long as I have. So how many of you remember that cover of, it was either Time or Newsweek a few years ago, that had the picture of a very beautiful young Afghan woman that had horrifically been mutilated, half her nose had been cut off uh, by the Taliban. And the caption read, what happens if we leave? And I wanted to yell at the editor, whoever he was, and I'm pretty sure it was a he, although you don't know, and say, what are you thinking? This is about what happens when we're there. This isn't about what happens when we're not there. This is about what happens when we're there. What are you thinking? You know, it's just, it's insane. The situation in Palestine for Palestinians is worse than ever. The siege of Gaza continues. We've all been hearing about the number of Israelis killed, very tragically, it's now up to eight, who have been killed by mainly very young people, many of them actually children, many of them young teenagers, acting as what they call lone wolves, acting on their own, not told to do it by anybody, but reacting to the conditions in which they live using knives, and eight Israelis have been killed. And we've been hearing a lot about that. And that's appropriate, it's a horrific thing. What we haven't heard so much about is that 56 Palestinians have been killed in that same period, in those same three weeks. About 11 of them were people who were charged, when well, they weren't ever charged, but they were blamed for some kind of attack. So they were killed. The, the, uh, the, the Palestinians who killed other Israelis have been acting as individuals. The 56 Palestinians, only a very small number of whom were even blamed for carrying out an act of violence, were killed overwhelmingly by Israeli soldiers and police, a few by Israeli settlers, and one by an Israeli mob. They were not killed by lone wolves acting on their own out of hysteria, except perhaps the one killed by a mob. They were killed by soldiers and police acting under orders. There's also been an Israeli who was killed who somebody thought was an Arab, and there's been another uh, an Eritrean refugee, an asylum seeker who was killed because he was African, he was black, so obviously he had to be a terrorist too. We're not hearing so much about the question of Palestinians who are being killed in the day-to-day -day context of what occupation means. The Israeli answer to this has been to build more walls, not just the wall that surrounds the West Bank, and moves into the West Bank to steal what amounts to about 11.5% of the total land of the West Bank. And of course, you all know about the wall around Gaza. Gaza is completely enclosed by a wall as well, where it's not bordered on the ocean. But they're now building walls within East Jerusalem, occupied East Jerusalem, which now has so many Israeli settlers, illegal Israeli settlers, living in occupied East Jerusalem that they more or less match the numbers of Palestinians who live there. And the response of the Israelis has been to build walls, separating now whole neighborhoods. So walling off the traditional Palestinian neighborhoods of East Jerusalem and allowing the Israeli settlements in East Jerusalem, which are inappropriately named neighborhoods, as if because they've been there a long time that suddenly makes them legal, uh, wall, they're being all walled off and separated from each other. This is the, the answer. 
to this kind of violence. Even the UN Under Secretary General the other day said something that UN officials are not known for, since they, they're not known for this kind of bravery. It shouldn't take courage, but indeed it does in the real world of real politique. He said, talking about bringing back calm is not the answer. Talking about ending the violence makes no sense unless we're talking about ending the occupation. Now he might have added also ending apartheid, ending the denial of the right of return, etc. But it was an important start. It was an important recognition that simply an end to the violence does not solve the problem. So we're, le we're, we're looking now at a set of intersecting crises with global actors in each case. It's not only the people on the ground, it's their supporters in the region and around the world. So this is indeed the old global war on terror, but it's a different version. It's the, the global war on terror 2.0. Um, for those of you who are not so computer savvy, that means the next generation of the global war on terror. But, you know, think about this, the, the GWAT, you know, this is one of my favorite acronyms, the global war on terror, but, but it sounds like, it sounds so evil, that word, the GWAT, right? So it was always my favorite of the Washington, the Washington uh, uh, acronyms. But one of the first things that President Obama did when he first came into office, he sent a memo to the White House staff, to the State Department, to the Pentagon, saying this administration would prefer that we not refer to the so-called global war on terror. That is not our strategy. We would prefer that you use the term overseas contingency operations. Talk about an Orwellian term. You know, it's anodyne, it sounds like oh, there's, there's been a typhoon and we're going to have an, a, uh, an, a contingency operation to rebuild the city. You know, really? It's a war. Call it what it is. It's a global war and you say it's on terror. I don't happen to believe that you can bomb terrorism out of existence. But that seems to be the basis for saying we're at war against ISIS, wherever they may be. We're at war with this idea. And you know, we're, we're, we've just passed the first anniversary of the direct US involvement in the, the war against ISIS, the, the beginning of, the, of the, uh, the bombing campaign in Iraq and Syria. And we've had, up until now, somewhere over 7,900 airstrikes in a little more than a year. And there's a group in the UK called Air, Air Wars something, Air Wars Center, I think it is. And they did some investigating to look at those airstrikes. And they singled out just 52 of those airstrikes out of the 7,900 to see what was the proportion of who was getting killed in these airstrikes. They, some of them were drone strikes. And you know, we hear that these airstrikes and these drone strikes are more accurate than any military attacks in history, that we take more care to avoid civilian casualties. You know, we heard from President Obama when he gave his speech explaining what the drone war was all about. And he said, we have very, very strict criteria that f before a drone can be used, before there can be an airstrike, that first there has to be a, uh, you know, enough information, enough intelligence that we know there is almost no chance of civilian casualties. Okay. So even putting aside for a minute the legality or illegality of the strike in the first place, I'll get to that in a minute, but from their own standards, that sounds like it makes sense. You don't do it if there's any chance of civilian casualties. Except, so what did these researchers in the UK find? They found that out of those 52 that they looked at, there were at least 459 non-combat deaths, of which at least 100 were children. That's just 52, that's 1% less than 1%, it's about 3 quarters of 1% of the total number of airstrikes. So do we really want to believe this claim that this is based on the idea that we will only use this force if we can be sure there are no civilian casualties? The drone papers, how many of you have heard about the drone papers, this new leak? Yeah, a lot of you have. So there's been this new leak from the Pentagon that they're calling the drone papers. And The Intercept, this terrific new group of, of great journalists, has written five major analysis pieces about it and released the documents themselves onto the internet. And what they found was that, for example, in one period in 2012, 
in Pakistan, when you know, there are these meetings every Tuesday morning, the kill meetings at the White House, where the top staff meet with the president, including the Secretary of the Treasury, the Secretary of State, the, the Secretary of Defense, etc. They meet and they go through the list of who should be on the kill list at that time. And during that period, there were 20 names on that list, 20 people who had been a, a, approved for assassination by the highest ranking officials in the land. During that period, there were over 200 people killed by drones in that area, which means that at best, assuming that all 20 were among those dead, we, we have no idea if they were or were not, but assuming they were, that means that 90% of those killed by drones are not the ones on the list. So this notion that we only will use these weapons when we can be sure there are no civilian casualties, and President Obama also told us that we will only use, we will only authorize these drone strikes when the, the, the target, they never say the person, when the target represents an immediate imminent threat. Immediate imminent threat. Imminent is a pretty common word. We know what it means. They're building a bomb. They're placing a bomb. They're loading a gun. That's an imminent threat. But it turns out that at these meetings, when they make the decision about who's on the list, the list gets sent over to the Pentagon and to the CIA, who are then told that they have 60 days to go after these people. Nobody is an imminent threat for 60 days. You gotta sleep sometime. So it's really not true that it's an imminent threat. It's maybe once they were an imminent threat, maybe not, but give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe once they were seen doing something really bad and really dangerous. But if you didn't get them, they're no longer an imminent threat. So you still get to assassinate them? Apparently the answer is yes. That's what we're not hearing as much about. We're hearing a lot about the refugees, but we're not hearing all the stories about the refugees. We're hearing a lot right now about the situation in Europe, and it is dire. It is absolutely dire. There has not been a refugee flow like this since World War II. There are something like 650,000 refugees, mainly about somewhere between half and two-thirds of them from Syria, now flooding into Europe. That's a, a, a dramatic challenge for the Europeans to deal with. And we're hearing about that constantly. We're hearing about the fighting among the European leadership, et cetera, et cetera. We're not hearing very much about the vast majority of the refugees who are not heading towards or getting into Europe. They are in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, surround, in the countries surrounding Syria. So there's 2.2 million Syrian refugees just in Turkey. There's one and a half million refugees just in Jordan. There's 1.25 million refugees just in Lebanon. In Lebanon right now, one out of every four people in the country is a Syrian refugee. Imagine if we had, if I do the math right, I think it's about 80 million Canadians suddenly in our country with nothing but the clothes on their back and not very many clothes because they came in the summer and now it's suddenly winter that we have to take care of. Imagine, that's what Lebanon is facing, if you put it in the, you know, as an equivalent to population. And let me just tell you one other story that we're not hearing very much about when we hear about the refugees. The people who are fleeing are people who are desperate and they want, they're afraid of their, for their children's lives. They're afraid their children could be killed by bombing from any of the various sides that are fighting in their country. They're afraid that their children have not had an education for three years. They're afraid that there's no hospital if their child gets sick because the hospitals have been bombed. They're afraid of all those things. They want their child to have a life. Ideally a better life, but at least a life. So they flee with their children. Who gets left behind are the grandparents, the old people. And what we're hearing now, this came from two Iraqi doctors who have worked for a long time with people in this country who have challenged the effect of sanctions in Iraq and were against the war in Iraq. And one of them said she's a, she's a pediatric oncologist who works at one of the main hospitals in Baghdad that's still semi-functional. And she said, you know, I've wanted to leave for years, but I can't. I, my, I, there's no one else for my patients. I, I have, you know, hundreds of children now who I'm their only doctor, all these kids with with various cancers. And she said, but now what's starting to happen is all the people we know, 
our neighbors, our friends, who are fleeing. And they go and they end up in, in a refugee camp in Turkey. Or maybe they succeed and they make it to Germany, they're successful or whatever. And then suddenly grandma's house is bombed. Or grandpa falls and breaks a hip. And we get the phone call saying, can you take care of my parents? I, I can't help them. My parents need help. Can you take care of them? And she said, suddenly I'm not only taking care of hundreds of children who are my patients, as well as my own parents and my own family, but I'm, I'm trying to deal with my friend's parents who have no one left to take care of them because the years of war have shredded the social fabric of this country. That's the part of the refugee crisis we don't hear about. So that's what I mean when I say that it's really worse than we thought, these intersecting crises. It reflects the absolute failure of US policy, which is a military policy. The military policy has failed. And now they keep saying, well, we're going to do it again, but we'll do it better. We, we spent, you know, you all heard about the $500 million that was designed. They couldn't find the pro-Western, secular, democratic, anti-ISIS, and sort of anti-Assad, but not really anti-Assad. That's the militia we want. And what a surprise, they couldn't find it. So they said, okay, we'll make one. We'll, we'll create our own. We'll, we'll build it up. So the Congress allocated $500 million, half a billion dollars, to create 5,400 fighters in this new militia who were going to be pro-America and Western and pro-democracy and fight against ISIS, but not fight against Assad. Well, you all know the story. They ended up with 120, because they couldn't get any more who could pass the vetting process. <clears throat> of the 120, half dropped out in the first few weeks, and most of them left with their weapons and turned them right over to Al-Qaeda. The others, they finally graduated 54. And they put 54 people, to the tune of $500 million, into the war front. Well, within two weeks, almost all of them had either been captured, they had abandoned ship, they had turned over their weapons and fled. So when the chairman of the, not the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, it was the chief of Central Command, the chief of CENTCOM, was testifying in front of the House Armed Services Committee. And he said, he was asked, so how many are left? And he said, well, it's a very small number. We're talking four or five. Not four or five hundred, not four or five thousand, four or five. And there was like silence for a minute. Because I think people thought, that can't be right. I, I must have not heard that right. But that was right. That is what five hundred million dollars of creating a new militia gets you. It gets you four people who are all probably either dead, captured, or have abandoned their posts by now. This policy is failing. I, that's not even talking about the hundreds of millions more that the, that the CIA was given to arm pretty much anybody in town who said they would go against ISIS. They don't have any of this vetting stuff. They'll give weapons to anybody, it appears. But that isn't working so well either, as we know. So the result is what? ISIS still controls a vast swath of territory. It rules over somewhere between five and six million people. Syria, Iraq, Libya have been completely destabilized by these, by these attacks. And we hear from President Obama, oh yeah, well, the, of course we know that the military tactics are not sufficient. We also need diplomacy and humanitarian stuff and, you know, all those other things. Well, he's right when he said there is no military solution. But he's wrong when he says the military solution isn't enough. Because what he's ignoring, I would say willfully, is the reality that it's not just that it's not enough by itself, it's that when you're doing the military stuff, nothing else is possible. You can't create a ceasefire when you're in there fighting. You can't win hearts and minds when you're bombing the people you're trying to reach. So you have to stop that before you can do all these other things. So there's all this stuff about, you know, why are we at war? It's a lot of the same reasons as it was under the Bush administration. There's questions of oil, there's questions of Israel, there's questions of stability, there's questions of projection of power through the bases. You know, if you want to project power around the world defined as sending bombers, the Middle East is a pretty important place to be. You can have bases there that you can attack Asia, you can attack Africa, you can attack Europe. You're sitting very pretty right there. So that's, you know, all those things still exist. 
Regime change, eh, it's not so clear. The, let's, you know, we should be pretty clear that the regime in, in Syria has actually been quite helpful both to Israel and to the United States. It's kept the occupied Golan Heights very quiet, has prevented any kind of an uprising there. They acted as the, the venue of choice for, US, for the US to send detainees during the first global war on terror, knowing that people would be tortured there. People like Maher Arar, a Canadian citizen, who was arrested by mistake at Kennedy Airport, interrogated by US officials for three weeks. And when they couldn't get him to confess to anything, because he hadn't done anything, wasn't a terrorist, didn't know any terrorists, they sent him off to Syria to be tortured for over a year. And when the Canadians realized that maybe the, the Canadians, I mean, the, the Syrians finally sent him back after torturing him for a year, said, we can't get anything out of this guy. We don't think he did anything. And the Canadians thought, oh God, maybe we made a big mistake here. We better investigate. And they established a commission. They issued a report that goes on for hundreds and hundreds of pages, completely exonerating him of any wrongdoing and paid him $10 million in compensation. What did the US do? Who was the main actor in sending him off to be tortured in Syria? We put him on the no entry list to the United States. So when my institute gave him our annual human rights awards, along with his lawyers from the Center for Constitutional Right, a few years ago, he couldn't come to accept it. He had to accept it by video, because he's not allowed to enter the United States. That's our definition of the global war on terror. So what are we dealing with? There's still pressure to go to war. There's pressure from those who profit from war. And you know, we hear all the time, nobody profits from war. Nobody benefits from this war. Nobody wants this war. Boy, is that wrong. You all in peace action, you know that better than most. That there are people, there's not a lot of them, but the ones who are, they're very powerful, who profit big time from war. People like the CEOs and the shareholders of the major corporations who produce the planes that drop the bombs and the computer programs that make the bombs smart bombs. All of that, they are making a killing in every sense of the word on these wars. So, all of that means we are paying the price. Others pay the price in blood. We pay the price in tax money. Maine alone, most of you live in Maine, right? You pay taxes in Maine, don't you? Just in Maine alone, just since August of last year, August of 2014, it's been a year and two months, in the so-called global war on ISIS, the state of Maine has paid $18.3 million for that war of your tax money. Now imagine what you could do with that tax money if you had it back at home. You could put 181 kids in Head Start every year for 10 years. You could hire 11, uh, 28 elementary school teachers for 10 years. You could give 898 low-income kids health care for 10 years. Or you could provide 3,400 houses with wind energy to save the environment. What's going to make us safer? Protecting the climate, protecting the environment, health care and education, or sending more bombs to kill people around the world? What's going to make us safer? Those are the questions we have to ask. So why does this happen? It happens partly because we've been taught by George Bush, and it's been unfortunately reflected by President Obama, that when you do something, the only option is military. Because the real choice is what President Bush said the day after the 9-11 attacks. We either go to war, or we let them get away with it. Nothing in between. If you don't go to war, you're letting them get away with it. And since nobody wants to, quote, let them get away with it, people support war. They supported a war in Afghanistan that they were told was a war for justice and a war to bring to justice those perpetrators. Well, I'm sorry, but it didn't work that way. It was a war for vengeance, not for justice. And it was a war to prepare the way for the much bigger war to come in Iraq. So the question of these wars has everything to do with how we understand what it means to respond to crises around the world, because these are very real crises. When President Obama finally decided, after a lot of pressure against it, to start bombing in Syria and send troops back to Iraq in 2014, it, that was launched by the demand from people ar across this country for all the right reasons who were seeing what was happening to the Syrian Kurds, the, the Yazidi Kurds, who were surrounded by ISIS on Mount Sinjar. And they were stuck, and they were facing a really dire set of circumstances. And so people said, we've got to do something for all the right reasons. But it was interpreted to mean, we've got to go to war to do something about it. 
As it turned out, all those airstrikes, only two of them were anywhere near Mount Sinjar. The others were all up near Erbil, where they were there to protect the oil fields of, of Iraqi Kurdistan. But the Kurds on the mountain, the Yazidis, were not saved by those airstrikes. They were saved by a group of Syrian Kurdish militias, the YPG, who managed to open up a corridor on the back of the mountain, get them off the mountain, get them to safety inside Syria, down along the border, and then back into Iraq. That's what saved their lives, not the US. So this notion that somehow the only choice is to go to war or do nothing simply isn't the case. And we have to stop making it that kind of Manichaean reality, because what we're facing right now in Syria is at least eight separate wars involving regional players and, and global players, all of whom are fighting to the last Syrian. One of the regional wars is between Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. But it's not Iranians and Saudis who are being killed. It's Syrians. There's a war being waged between the US and Russia over sea lanes and over bases, our base in, in Bahrain and their base in, in Syrian Tartus. But it's not Americans and Syrians that are being, uh, Americans and Russians that are being killed. It's Syrians. The wars are being waged to the last Syrians. So OK, these wars are being waged. Who's ISIS? What's their role in all this? What, what's, why is this all being called the war against ISIS? Many of you have heard, well, let me ask, how many of you have heard this line that ISIS emerged when President Obama pulled the troops out of Iraq? I didn't ask if you agree with it, just how many of you have heard it? Everybody, pretty much. The, the ones of you who are not raising your hands, you're just chicken to raise your hands. You know you've heard it. Because it's everywhere. This is the line that's out there, right? ISIS emerged when President Obama pulled the troops out of Iraq. Well, that's just wrong. Because we know the history of ISIS. It's not a secret. They've been very public. ISIS was created not in 2011, but in 2004. Not when troops were pulled out of Iraq, but when troops were at their height in Iraq. It was one year after the invasion and occupation of Iraq. And it was, at the time, it had a different name. It was then called Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia or Al-Qaeda in Iraq. It was one of a number of Sunni-based militias who were fighting against the US occupation and against the Shia-dominated government the US had put in place. They weren't the only one. They weren't the biggest or the most powerful, but they were one of the bigger ones. And over time, they got bigger. They changed their name one of the, in the book. The, the book is done as frequently asked questions. It's, it's like a website in a book, in a, essentially. And one of the questions is, why do these people have so many names? Why can't they just pick one? So I go through the history of how they changed the names and when they changed the names and what they were doing differently that indicated what was new and different, so they changed their name. There's a logic to it, in fact. I'm not going to go through it all now. But they were created at the period of the height of the US occupation. As the situation inside Iraq became more, more sectarian, the sectarian civil war emerged kind of in parallel to the anti-occupation war. ISIS was playing a major role in that. And that's a huge problem. It is a hugely violent, horrific organization. The stuff we read in the paper about their violence, the stuff we see on TV, I don't think is being exaggerated. I think it's true. It's as bad as we're seeing, maybe worse. What we're not seeing about that level of violence, the beheadings, all those things, is that they're not the only ones doing it. That's the part that's missing. We're being told ISIS has to be brought down because they're doing things like beheading people. Because it sounds so horrific. It sounds like, and it is indeed in their case, straight out of the seventh century. It's barbaric. But let's be clear who else is beheading people right now. The day after ISIS beheaded the two Western journalists, the Free Syrian Army, our guys, the Western guys, the Democratic guys, the secular guys, they beheaded six people and killed two more who were prisoners that they had captured in a raid. So it's not only ISIS that's beheading people. Saudi Arabia beheads people almost every day, officially and legally, because that's their method of execution. And the death penalty applies for things like witchcraft, heresy, it's astonishing what qualifies for the death penalty in Saudi Arabia. You all probably know about this 17-year-old kid who's facing the death penalty. He will be beheaded for having participated in a, in a nonviolent protest against the government. He's 17, and he's facing the death penalty. And after he gets beheaded, 
it's already been announced publicly, he will then be crucified. His body will be crucified. Why would you do that? To terrify everybody else. That's why you do it. That's barbaric. But that's our best ally in the Arab world. That's the people that we just sold $60 billion worth of weapons to. That's the part we're not hearing. ISIS is a violent, barbaric outfit. But the only thing that they're doing differently, well, they're doing some things differently. But mostly, it's a difference that's quantitative rather than qualitative. The big qualitative difference is they brag about it. They create these incredible videos with music and all of this scary stuff and put it in our face. The Saudis try and deny it. They arrested a guy who leaked a, a secret video of one of the beheadings because they're not so proud of it when they have to deal with the West. ISIS, they like this stuff. So that's what we're dealing with here. But the real question for us is not so much ISIS alone. It's why are they so powerful? How is it that they manage to seize territory like this, that they're ruling over millions of people? And the answer is not that there's some magical capability that they're just better fighters or better guerrillas or something than everybody else. It's because they don't fight alone. They have massive support from three important contingents, the most important of which is a bunch of Sunni generals from Iraq who have been really, really angry since 2003 when the first thing the US occupation forces did was to dismantle the Iraqi military. And the second thing they did was to dismantle the civil service. So arguably, the two largest secular nationalist institutions in the country were the first victims of the US occupation. And they've been pretty pissed off about it ever since. And they've been sitting there without a job, without any way to defend their families, let alone the loss of their privilege, waiting for some way to fight back against this sectarian, Shia-dominated government in Baghdad that we put in power, that we arm, that we pay, that we legitimate in the world courts. And they've got their chance with ISIS. So the military strategy and military training of ISIS is almost entirely being carried out by these former Ba'athist generals. And I've got to tell you, I've met a couple of these guys. They are secular as we are. They drink, they smoke. They have no interest in this extremist fundamentalism. They have an interest in attacking and undermining this government. That's their interest. The same is true of the second group, which is the leadership of the Sunni militias, right? who are putting their militias, their tribal leaders. Iraq still is a very tribal society. Tribal militias are being put, placed at the at the, for the, the use of ISIS for the same reasons. Because the Sunni community in Iraq has suffered enormously, not just their loss of privilege. Loss of privilege is one thing. They should never have been privileged for 30 years, but they were. But when they lost their privilege, it also meant that they are facing massive numbers of young Sunni men being swept off to prison, torture and execution in the prisons, non-judicial execution of people in the streets, the bombing of a non-violent Sunni protest camp last year. It's been a really horrific time. And the result has been they're looking for a way to fight back. They don't see anybody else fighting for them. So they're willing under those circumstances to say ISIS is terrible, but they're better than the alternative. And the same is being thought by a component of the third grouping, which is ordinary Sunnis. Thankfully, not all of them, thankfully, not even a majority, but some who see ISIS as the lesser evil. And this is a disaster that we have to deal with because it goes directly to the situation we have created in that part of the world. So what do we do about it? This is, this is the, the huge challenge that we face. There's escalations going on. The US is escalating. It's, you know, the um, minister, sorry, the Secretary of Defense just said today, I was at Minister of Defense. The Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, just said today that we are going to escalate airstrikes and we are prepared to go in with more ground troops in Syria as well as in Iraq. The Russians have escalated. They're now bombing directly. So there's more bombs. There's more people on the ground. There's more people being killed. That's the bad news. The good news is what I started with, maybe now there's a chance there could be some real diplomacy. It's not a given. This is going to be a, a hard slog. But think back a week and a half ago at the UN, both President Obama and President Putin, they made speeches that were full of bombast, a lot of personal attacks on each other. But nonetheless, in both of their speeches, they made important 
rather slightly hidden concessions. So President Obama said explicitly, compromise is required, the situation has changed. And he referenced, although not in exactly the same words, what Secretary of State Kerry had said a, little, a few days earlier when he said Assad doesn't have to go on day one. He doesn't even have to go on month one. At some point in the future, there will have to be a transition to a post-Assad reality. That's a far cry from saying Assad has to leave as a precondition to having talks. That was a major concession. President Putin, with all of his bombast and all of his talk about Assad, made another concession. He said that what stands between the Syria and a takeover by ISIS is the Syrian state and its military. He didn't say the Syrian president and his military, which to me sounds like he's prepared to give up this guy over time and with appropriate face saving and probably, unfortunately, not appearing in the international criminal court, at least right away, but probably some kind of comfortable exile in the Crimea or wherever. But he's prepared to say, as long as our interests are protected, our interests meaning our base, our mili the Russian military base in Tartus, our access to arms sales, et cetera, et cetera, if those things are protected, there's something to talk about here. This is huge. This is huge. And the fact that now, today, we hear that, yes, finally, we recognize Iran has to be at the table, that's vital. This is the lesson from your main statesman, former, Secretary, uh, former Senator George Mitchell, after the Good Friday Accords, when he said, if you're serious about diplomacy, everybody has to be at the table. You can't leave somebody out because you think they're terrorists. That was what the, the British had said about the provisional IRA. We can't deal with them, they're terrorists. We will not deal with them. Of course, it turned out that there had been talks for three years before the talks were ever acknowledged. But he said, it's not because you like them, it's not because you trust them, it's because if, you're, if they're not there, you're giving them permission to completely violate whatever gets decided. It's crazy. If you're serious about diplomacy, everybody has to be at the table. Maybe somebody has finally learned the lesson. So finally, before I get to the, well, let me say one other thing about this, and then I want to talk for a minute about Israel and Palestine, and then open up for questions and comments and discussion, and some discussion, hopefully, of what do we do about all this. But before I get to that, just on this question of the global war on terror. So I mentioned that in the Syrian war is at the core right now of the crisis affecting the Middle East. There's plenty of other parts to it the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya that opened up the entire armories of Libya, which are now arming all kinds of crazy groups all over the Middle East and through half of Africa. All of this, there's plenty of disasters to go around. But right now, the war in Syria, which is actually at least eight separate wars, is the main part. So what do we do about that? What's our response? I think it starts with, number one, the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. Stop killing people. So stop the airstrikes, stop the drones. That's the, stop creating proxy armies. Just stop. You know, it's like when, you, when you're, you find yourself in a hole, the first step is to stop digging. You know, before you do anything else, stop digging further. Stop killing more people. That's step number one. Step number two, make real this claim that there are no troops on the ground. Bring them home. There's 3,500 tro 3, troops that we know about. Who knows how many more hundreds or dozens or thousands that we don't know about. Bring them all home. Make that real. Three, we need an arms embargo. This is the hardest one at all, of all because of the power of the military lobbies that are making a killing on these wars. But we, until we have a real ceasefire and an arms embargo on both sides, it's hopeless. You can't have a ceasefire while you're continuing to flood both sides with new weapons because why should they abide by it? The only way there can be a viable ceasefire, a viable truce, is if there's no more weapons flooding the place. So that has to be on, on the agenda. All of those weapons, look at our weapons. They've all ended up in the hands of ISIS and Al Qaeda. You know, I mean, let's be clear about it. We might as well just ship it directly and cut out the middleman. It's nuts. Number four is an easy one. Start enforcing the Leahy law. The, the US law that says it's illegal to send weapons, to sell weapons, give weapons, or provide weapons under any circumstances, 
to any military unit, whether it's one unit in an army or an entire army of a whole country, that has a history of human rights violations. Well, that's, you know, you know that saying, you can't swing a cat without hitting whatever the saying says. But in my, that part of the world, you can't swing a cat without hitting human rights violators. That's pretty much everybody on all sides. That's an easy one. Just start enforcing it. Number five and number six are diplomacy. We need more diplomacy. We need diplomacy on dealing with Iraq. That means we have to talk to Iran. We've got a chance now. We've got openings after the Iran deal. We've got to start talking to Iran about what we're going to do about this crazy government in Baghdad that is really a very big problem. Not only the corruption, not only the incompetence, but the incredible sectarianism. The new prime minister talks a better talk than the last guy, but he walks the same walk. He's from the same party. It's not so surprising. And we need a bigger level of global diplomacy to deal with the war in Syria all-sidedly. Yes, we have to support the UN efforts right now on the ground to create these small-scale local ceasefires, local truces. Some of them are holding. The goal is to get more and more of them so eventually they can link up with each other. And maybe it'll be a whole city, not just one neighborhood. Then maybe a whole region. You know, that's part of it. But then you need from the other side, from the top down, you need real diplomacy, bringing together all of the global and regional actors that are actually enabling and fighting these proxy wars in, in Syria. So we need to stop that. Then we need to reverse one, this is another easy one, we need to reverse one US Supreme Court decision. It's a Supreme Court decision known as Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. And what it says is that if you go to the Middle East and you find a bunch of guys in ISIS or some people in Hamas, or somebody in the Turkish PKK. All of these organizations are on the US list of foreign terrorist organizations, right? You find any of those people, and you teach them nonviolence. You teach them how to use nonviolence, how to train others in nonviolence. Or you teach them how to access the United Nations human rights system. You would not be welcomed in Washington. You would mm -hmm. face 10 years in a federal prison for providing material support to terrorists. The, the, the opinion of the court said explicitly those two examples, teaching nonviolence or accessing the UN human rights system are providing material support to terrorists. We've got to stop that law. We've got to reverse that. That's an easy one. And then finally, this one should be so easy and so obvious. We have to dramatically increase our humanitarian support. We hear constantly, the US gives more money than anybody else. Well, damn right we do, and we should. We own 28% of the wealth of the whole world, and we're only 5% of its people. That means we should be paying, at least as a starting point, 28% of the $5 billion the UN says it needs to take care of the refugees. You know, there's resentment in this country about taking care of refugees. And I get that. People have lost jobs. People have lost houses. People have been foreclosed on. It's, it's a terrible time still in this country. But think about what these refugees are going through when we think about where our money goes. You know, if we stop paying for this war, which is costing now $10 million a day, if we stop for just a month, that would give us pretty much all we'd need. The UN has just announced that they can no longer provide food aid to any refugees in Turkey that are not in the camps. Only half of the refugees in Turkey are in the camps. The others are trying to scratch out a living in a city or living in a public park or sharing an apartment with five other families or something. But now they're not going to get any food. Why? Because the UN doesn't have any money to pay for food rations for anybody outside the camps. They're supposed to just starve. It's a way to deal with it. You know, it's a way to get rid of some of them. We need to be offering to take in 28% as a starting point of all those refugees who need international resettlement. Most of the refugees, as I said earlier, are not going to Europe. They don't want to leave the region. They want to go home when the war is over. But there are some that need to be resettled somewhere else. And we should be taking at least 28% of them. We can start with the 100,000 that a number of aid groups are calling for. That's not a bad start. That's not 28%, but OK, I'll settle. You know, it's, we need to be doing so much more than we're doing. 
The same thing is true, and I'll, I'll end with this part, about Israel-Palestine. You know, I, I talked before about sort of what we're hearing from in the press about the current rise in violence. And, you know, there's an old saying in, in, in journalism circles to, that blood sells. You know, blood sells. Good, good coverage of, of bloody incidents is what you see on the front pages. In this case, it's only Israeli blood that seems to make it to the front pages. And down in paragraph 17, you hear, oh yes, and then some Palestinians were also killed, some of them in a nonviolent protest by Israeli soldiers. Okay, well, what do we do about that? 56 Palestinians killed and eight Israelis, and it's the eight Israelis whose names we know and who they were. We don't know that about the Palestinians. We don't learn who they were. Imagine if today all the violence stopped. Imagine what would be the difference for Israelis and Palestinians. For Israelis, if there were no violence, which always means Palestinian resistance violence, some of which is indeed illegal, some of which is legal, but imagine if there were no violence. Israelis would have a pretty great life. They're the 23rd wealthiest country in the world. Why we give them any aid is a little bit beyond me. We're, we're about to, to go from 30 billion over the last 10 years to 47 billion, more than one and a half times as much over the next 10 years. And that's only military aid. That's direct to the Israeli military. Yeah, that's something for a campaign for peace action. <laughs> but imagine if the violence stopped Israelis, it would be great. They have a passport that's valid everywhere. They travel, they go around the world. They have a vibrant economy, a culture that's exciting and new and different. What's not to like? What would it be like for Palestinians if the violence stopped today? They would still be living under siege in Gaza. You still can't get out, violence or no violence. You can't get out through the wall in the West Bank. You're still living under occupation you're still facing second or third or fourth class citizenship. Uh, you, you can't live as a normal citizen, even if you happen to be a citizen of Israel, if you're a Palestinian, because even though you have the rights of citizenship, you have the right to vote, you have the right to run for the Knesset, but you don't have equal rights because not all rights are determined by citizenship. Some rights are determined by nationality. And there are some rights for Jews, and other rights and non-rights for non-Jews. So none of that changes if there's no violence. Right now we're hearing calls for international protection for the Palestinians, something that's been on, on the UN's agenda at various points off and on for 20 years or more. But nobody's ever taken it seriously. Now suddenly people are taking it a little bit seriously, talking about what would it look like, how would it work, because unfortunately Israeli blood was shed. For the last 20 years, there's not been significant levels of violence against Israelis. There's been isolated instances here and there, but not this kind of all at one time happening over and over again. And yet nothing changed except more settlements were built. The siege of Gaza was tightened. Calm, as they like to call it, didn't bring the Palestinians anything. So anyone that's surprised that youngsters, some of them as young as 13, are lashing out finally because they simply can't take it anymore. And they're being presented with no options for what nonviolent protest might look like on a massive scale. There is nonviolent protest going on in the Palestinian territories on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, that has never ended. But it hasn't worked. So it's not surprising that kids are lashing out. It's not a good thing. It's a terrible thing. But it isn't surprising. And if we're serious about stopping it, we've got to be serious about ending occupation and ending apartheid. And I'm going to end right there. But I think the one thing that seems consistent is that Putin has a set of interests in Syria that are Russian interests. And the Assad family, father and son, have been quite loyal in ensuring that those interests were protected. I think that like most authoritarian leaders and democratic leaders and all other leaders of countries, the definition that those leaders bring to how they assess another country is based on interests, not on friendships. So the protection of Assad has been, I think, on the basis of Assad is protecting our base at Tartus. They're consistently buying our weapons and other stuff. 
They're allowing us access for pipelines and that sort of thing. There's trade issues, there's economic issues, there's strategic issues, and there's military issues. I think, as I said earlier, that if negotiations were established that made sure that Russian interests, at least other than maybe the military ones about you know, bombing, um, if the other interests were protected, I have no reason to think that Assad would refuse those negotiations or would block the results of those negotiations on the ground that he wants Assad personally to be protected. I think he's a pretty ruthless guy with his own assistants, his own cabinet, his own whatever. I can't imagine he's all that loyal to the, to the leader of another country. I think he's loyal to what he perceives as Russia's interests. And if they're protected by somebody else, Assad can go. Now, there will be, I, just the caveat is, he's expended a fair amount of political capital in defending Assad, which means he's not going to simply abandon him. And it probably means some version of letting him off the hook for international justice, at least for some period of time, unfortunately. That challenge between justice and peace at the international diplomatic level is a very real one. And I'm afraid it's not going to go well for the justice side uh, in that context, but it could lead to ending the war. Ronnie Moffat is an extraordinary hero of mine. Ronnie Moffat was a 25-year-old development assistant at the Institute for Policy Studies in 1976 when she drove to work one day with her husband and a colleague named Orlando Letelier, who had been the former Chilean ambassador to the United States, had been arrested and tortured at the time of the coup, and when he was released from prison, he was sent into exile and in the United States, he was working at the Institute for Policy Studies. He was actually working as the director of the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam, which was at the time a project of IPS. And Ronnie and her husband, Michael, they had only been married for four months. Michael worked at IPS as well. He was Orlando's assistant, and their car was being fixed, so they had arranged to drive in with Orlando. And when they were driving down Massachusetts Avenue, what's known as Embassy Row in Washington, and came to Sheridan Circle, a terrorist in the pay of the Chilean junta, led by, we now know just let, from papers released just two weeks ago, led directly and ordered by the then president of Chile, Augusto Pinochet, General Pinochet, uh, pressed a button to activate the car bomb that had been loaded on their bomb last night and they were assassinated in the streets of Washington in what was at the time the worst act of international terrorism that had ever happened in the US Capitol. And Ronnie and Orlando were killed. They were in the front seat. Michael survived because he was in the back seat and was thrown clear. Uh, and Ronnie Moffat was, from what I know, I didn't know her at the time, but I found out when I came to IPS, I, we hold two events every year in their, in their honor. One is, and I mentioned this earlier, the, the human rights awards that are given to human rights fighters, one domestic and one international each year. The, one of the international awards had gone to Maher Arar. But we also have on the Sunday closest to the actual day of the assassination, we have a smaller event with music and poetry and family members for friends and people who were around at the time. At the site, uh, at Sheridan Circle, there's a, a little park there, and it's right across the street from the Chilean embassy. These days, of course, when there's a progressive government in Chile, the ambassador comes and speaks and invites us back to the embassy for a reception afterwards. It's very lovely. But when I went the first time, when I first got to IPS almost 20 years ago, I went across the street. What we do at the end, people bring flowers uh, for, the, for the event. And then after the, the program is over, we take the flowers and leave them across the street where there's a, um, uh, what do you call it, a, a plaque on a tree trunk right across, right where the car was, where it blew up. And I brought my flowers and I looked at the plaque. I hadn't seen it before. And they had the, the birth dates of Ronnie and Orlando with a beautiful carved plaque. And I realized that Ronnie and I were exactly the same age. She was nine days older than me. And it suddenly, we had a lot in common, it turned out. Um, our fathers had both worked in delis and candy stores in, in New Jersey. Uh, we both grew up Jewish, you know. So we had a lot in common. And I was, of course, you know, anguished that I never got to meet her. But the other problem is that because the bomb was aimed at Orlando Letelier, Ronnie gets too little attention sometimes. 
because she was sort of only the victim, not the target. And that's a big problem. So our awards every year are the Letelier Moffat Awards every year. 